Hope College's NEA Big Read Lakeshore program began in 2014 with the goal to create and foster a culture where reading matters. By bringing the Lakeshore community together around a common book, the Big Read Lakeshore uses the shared experience of reading, discussing, and exploring the themes of the book as a springboard to listen to and learn from each other. The NEA Big Read Lakeshore program is made possible in part by a grant from the NEA Big Read, a program of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with Arts Midwest. As I end my time at Hope in just few, a few weeks being a senior, one of the things I am most grateful for is the emphasis of community both at Hope and with the Holland community. We are so glad to, that you're here to celebrate literature and gather in community with us. And we also have appetizers in the back to enjoy. What a joy it is to gather together after a few years of all virtual gatherings. And with that, I'll pass it over to Wynne to introduce our speaker for the evening. Hello, everyone. OK. So glad that you're here. I've um, been looking forward to this night for, for months now. And um, so I met Leif first through his books, like you did. Um, his first novel that came out, Peace Like a River, I was, well, actually, Miska was first instantly smitten. And then she said, you have to read this. And I said, OK. And when I was done, I said, yes, I had to read that. And then have followed through with So Brave, So Young, So Handsome, Virgil Wander, and now eagerly anticipating the next novel to come, which I think we're going to get a tiny little glimpse of this evening. But um, when I was a pastor in Charlottesville, Virginia, I found after a little while that I didn't enjoy going to pastor's conferences. And instead, I would, I would figure out, I still need to take like a retreat of some sort, I would find somebody that I wanted to meet, and I would go and try to meet them. And so Leif was on the short list, and I emailed him soon after he and Robin had moved to Duluth, and I said, you don't know me, my name's Wynn, uh, I would love to come and have lunch with you or breakfast or something. If I came to Duluth, could I do that? And he wrote back and said, sure, you want to stay with us? And I thought, this guy's crazy. Um, there's no reason, there's no way that that's safe, um, but uh, have struck up a beautiful friendship. And I wanted to say, um, I, I love Leif because I really love good and beautiful writing, and he is, I think, one of our best. Um, but the more I've gotten to know him, I love Leif because he loves the truth, and he cares about things that are true. And he also loves. He, he loves pretty fiercely. And I don't know if you would say that about yourself, but I see it. And so I am really glad and eager to uh, welcome Leif this evening. What's going to happen is he's going to share some thoughts with us, read a little bit, and then we're going to have some Q&A. And then afterwards, if you'd like to, to purchase a book, you can. Or if you brought one to be signed, he's going to do a book signing, and there will be some food. So welcome, Leif. Okay, uh, hand that back to you. Uh oh, man, I'm like a I'm like a noob. <laughs> Thank you so much, Wynn. Thanks for that that cool introduction. Uh, I was surprised when you when you wrote to me, and my my instantly saying, "Can you you want to come and stay?" was absolutely a function of uh, Robin and I had just bought our first large house. Um, we, we raised our kids in a really small house of 1,200 square feet. And then we, um, and then we bought a house in Duluth uh, that is a, a big old wonderful house of three stories. And I just couldn't wait to show it to somebody. I was like, look what we did. Uh, <laughs> but I loved that. I thought that was a, that was a courageous thing that you that you just reached out and said, yeah, I don't like conference as much. I'm like, yeah, me too. Um, how about if I come and do this instead? What a, what a great idea that is. I told my brother-in-law as a pastor about that, and he's like, why didn't I think of that 30 years ago? So I've got some things I want to read tonight and a few things I want to say, so I'm just organizing my materials here. 
You can tell I'm rusty. I haven't done this for a while, anything like this. It's so, it's so cool to be on the far end of... Remember Wind in the Willows and there's Mole at the very beginning and he's underground and he's like waking up? It's like, something tells me I need to dig upwards. And, uh, and finally he does, he pokes his head out. And it's like, that's how I think a lot of us are feeling now. So I'm here, um, I'm here because Wynn asked me to come and work with a, a cohort of writers that I am looking forward to doing over the next couple of days at the Eugene Peterson Center. I'm, I'm excited and nervous um, going into this. Excited because I, I'm just poking my nose out. Uh, for the first time in two years, and nervous because this group at the Peterson Center um, is interested in writing as a, a sacred art. And um, not only is that a larger phrase than I am man enough to lift, um, but also my perception of what is sacred has shifted during the pandemic, during these past, last couple of years. Uh, and why did that happen? Uh, a lot of reasons but I think primarily because the world got small. It got so small for a while. In a little bitty world, the sacred steps forward. So some background about me, my wife, uh, Robin and I uh, moved to our current home just a little bit before the pandemic. Before that, we had spent two decades um, on, a, on a farmstead in northern Minnesota, 40 acres. Uh, and then we up and left to a town that we'd only ever driven through on our way to elsewhere um, and moved to a tall old house on a tall old hillside in Duluth. Um, in storybook terms, the, the house is in the middle of the hillside and we live in the middle of the house. You know what an open plan is? If I say open plan, does that ring a bell? A term I learned from uh, television <laughs> where there's a big room and at one end there's a kitchen and then there's like an island and then there's some sofas over here and some chairs and maybe a fireplace so that everyone that you know can get together and socialize and talk while the host is pouring the wine and laying out the charcuterie. Another word I learned from television. Um, our place is the opposite of that. <laughs> um, it's big, but it's not an open plan. It is um, three stories of shadow and light and hallways and alcoves and creaking stairs and drafts we can't ever really hunt down and, and ravens talking to each other in the eaves. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and look at me, I can't even talk about it without grinning because it's a, the most fantastic place I've ever lived. If, if you're middle-aged and you're wondering if you should reimagine your lives at now at this late date, the answer is probably yeah. I don't want to talk too much about pandemic stuff because we're all tired of it. But when the lockdown happened, um, I started doing three things in the interest of keeping my sanity. Uh, first, I started walking a lot. I walked already a lot. But nothing like what happened after the pandemic locked us down. The tall house sits a few blocks from um, a beautiful fast-rushing fast creek that winds down through about a mile of old forest in Duluth and then it empties into Lake Superior. I just walked that um, every day, um, and that was like a starting point. Usually Robin went along. Sometimes I went alone. It wasn't a conscious routine, it wasn't a regimen. But you all know how this goes. Everything normal can be canceled. But you're still a creature. And you still have legs and, and lungs and eyes and you need to move. So we walked the creek and at first everything was so new because we were new to the area ourselves. And there is that joy of discovering the world outside your doors. Um, in the middle of the creek, there are these big, smooth boulders, these massive boulders. And, and you can, on a good day, you can leap out 
and, and land on the boulder and sit down for a while and it's super comfortable because there's so much moss on the boulder that you can just sit there and watch the water go past and, and the life go past. And I noticed about a week into lockdown that if I went in the morning, there'd be this yellow feral tomcat that was always drinking out of backwater or hunting by the backwater next to one of these boulders. Uh, if I went in the evening, I would see animals too at the same place, but they were usually a family of deer, a doe, and twin fawns. And they all knew I was there, and they would sort of keep an eye on me kind of respectfully until I got up and left, or until they got up and left. Uh, plus the birds that you can always hear at a creek like that, but you can't ever see. And I think what's going on there is my theory is that because the creek has such a loud voice, these birds have evolved to have louder voices themselves, piercing calls so that they can be heard. Uh, the creek just sounds beautifully loud. Um, I know I'm going to struggle for the words to explain the effect that these walks near my home uh, had on me and remain, keep having on me. Uh, because what's more mundane, after all, than walking out your back door and and just walking for two or three hours through your neighborhood and, and your neighbor's neighborhoods. But after a few weeks, things started to really shift. Um, for one thing, the yellow tomcat just stopped being spooked by me at all. Um, I would get to the, the place where I like to step out onto the boulder, and the tomcat wouldn't even lift his head out of the water. He would just keep drinking. He knew I was there. didn't matter. The deer just became so tame that you could literally stand next to a bush and put your hand out like this, and when the deer came up the trail, they would just brush your hand like you're, like you're a branch. Uh, pretty wonderful. I, I always used to think of feeling at home in places um, as, well, I got used to it. I got used to that place, and now I feel at home. This was the first time in my life that I felt strongly that the place had got used to me. Um, and, it was, and it was cool. It felt good. It felt nice. It felt native. Um, it felt like I was invisible. And I realized I really like being invisible. I really like feeling like I'm nature instead of someone coming to take dominion over nature. I like being the nature. Um, I think it's okay to be temporary. I think it's okay to be a short line in a long poem. There's a great novel um, by Larry McMurtry, not even one of his better known ones, but, but a terrific book called um, Duane's Depressed. And this book starts two years into his 60s. Duane Moore, a man who had driven pickups for as long as he had been licensed to drive, parked his pickup in his own carport one day and began to walk wherever he went. Um, <laughs> this book is, a, is about a man in the third act of his life who starts being afflicted by the big questions that eventually come for us all. Uh, like the best serious books, it's hilarious. Um, some writers love all their characters, if you notice this. Certain novelists love their characters. They love the, the heroes and the villains and the smart ones and the dumb ones and the cool ones and the, the nerdy ones. They love them all. McMurtry was like that. Uh, Dickens is like that. Ann Tyler is like that. So generous. Anyway, Duane starts walking everywhere he goes in this, in this book, and obviously what happens is he sees things that you don't see when you're going past at 70 miles an hour. And lockdown, I think, just put us all in Duane's shoes. That is, we're kind of weirded out, uncertain about what's up ahead, but happy for the excuse to walk places. Most of us were tired of driving anyway. Glad for the excuse to look at some things close up. Second thing I did for sanity was to, to, uh, to start reading in the middle of the night. Um, I'm not a constant insomniac. I mean, there are nights that I do sleep through, but it's always a shock. Um, but in times of stress or high anxiety or, or illness, then I might wake up at 2 o'clock, and that's, that's just it. That's all there is. 
Um, a few years ago, my folks were, were failing um, with the illnesses that would carry them uh, away. And at that point, I discovered that the best thing I could do when I woke in the night was to read some neglected classic, something I had not got through back in college when I was supposed to. Um, I thought, well, if Moby Dick can't put me to sleep, nothing can, right? Um, and then what unfailingly happened was that Moby Dick, for example, and later Don Quixote, turn out to be these gripping books. They turn out to be great um, and, and, and funny, and they didn't help me sleep at all. But they did improve my mental health, like, a lot. Um, so when the pandemic hit, and once again, sleep became incredibly elusive, I... I had an idea what to do. This time I did not go in for the 1,800-page sagas. I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't do that. I did revisit some favorites, but mostly I lucked into some voices I, I didn't know. Um, like this, and, and, and I'm never happy unless I can say, here's a book you've got to read. Um, the, the one I'm going to talk about right now and just give you a taste of is called... Um, the Memory Police. It's by Yoko Ogawa. And I don't even know how to talk about this. Uh, the best stories are vivid, continuous dreams, to steal John Gardner's phrase. I'll just jump in, read you a little bit. I sometimes wonder what was disappeared first among all the things that have vanished from this island. Long ago, before you were born, there were many more things here, my mother used to tell me when I was still a child. Transparent things, fragrant things, fluttery ones, bright ones, wonderful things you can't possibly imagine. It's a shame that the people who live here haven't been able to hold such marvelous things in their hearts and minds. But that's just the way it is on this island. Things go on disappearing one by one. It won't be long now, she added, You'll see for yourself, something will disappear from your life. Is it scary? I asked her, suddenly anxious. No, don't worry. It doesn't hurt, and you won't even be particularly sad. One morning, you'll simply wake up, and it'll be over, before you've even realized. Lying still, eyes closed, ears pricked, trying to sense the flow of the morning air, you'll feel something has changed from the night before, and you'll know that you have lost something that something has been disappeared from the island. My mother would talk like this only when we were in her studio in the basement. It was a large, dusty, rough-floored room built so close to the river on the north side you could clearly hear the sound of the current. I would sit on the little stool that was reserved for my use as my mother, a sculptor, sharpened a chisel or polished a stone with her file and talked on in her quiet voice. The island, she said, is stirred up after a disappearance. People gather in little groups out in the street to talk about their memories of the thing that's been lost. There are regrets and a certain sadness, and we try to comfort one another. It's a, if it's a physical object that has been disappeared, we gather the remnants up to burn or bury or toss in the river. But no one makes much of a fuss. It's over in a few days. Soon enough, things are back to normal, as though nothing has happened and no one can even recall what it was that disappeared. The whole book is this way. Uh, it feels like a vision or a warning, but also like a song or a piece of mythology. Um, one, of those, one of those myths you've probably never read, but you somehow know already. Man, I'll, I'll trade a few nights sleep for a story like that. It's a bargain. The books you need show up at the right time which feels like a, a sacred idea, but what do I know? I also started reading poetry again, not in the night, because at night you need something that'll carry you along for a while without too much work on your part. But in the morning you want a poem or two along with your coffee, along with your bagel. Part of this complete breakfast. Um, one day early in the pandemic, I got a note from my publisher saying, hey, there's a poet in St. Paul uh, who wants to get together with you and fly kites, uh, which, which sounds completely bananas. 
Um, but I wrote a book about an eccentric kite flyer and, and this poet got a hold of it and read it and, and assumed correctly that I am an eccentric kite flyer. Um, I think we all kind of know each other. Um, so one day we met on the shore of Lake Superior and, and we were, uh, you know, a couple middle-aged guys with masks around our necks and um, kites in our fists, you know, rolls of string. By the way, it's the ideal pandemic social experience because if you get too close to each other, your strings get tangled up. It's just natural distancing. But again, as with, as with Yoko Ogawa and Larry McMurtry um, and, the, and the Tall House and the Creek and the rest of it, um, the Rolling Stones are right. You know, you, you get what you need. So I'm going to read you one of Danny's poems. <laughs> this is called Synopsis. When Christ was in the garden and the guards came to gather him for the crucifixion, Peter manned up, shanked a Roman guard. The disciples were outnumbered. It was a ballsy move. Yet days later, when Peter was asked, weren't you with that Christ fellow? He was alone and afraid. He denied thrice before the cock crowed. Note to self, most of us seem to be at our best when we are with our tribe, cloaked in love. <laughs> uh, we were flying kites together later, because this is a thing we do now. Uh, and I remember him saying, can we just admit how awesome it was that Peter jumped up with his sword in his hand? You know, he takes such grief, Peter. Everybody remembers the damn rooster. I love how poets think. And then the last thing that I did um, to, to stay sane during lockdown, literally the day we went into lockdown was I started writing a book. And I'm usually quite deliberate, which other people call slow. Uh, but this draft took shape pretty fast, fast for me. Partly because all other distractions were just gone. Um, and partly because it felt like the story had been in there for a long time, kind of gathering itself and waiting for me to open the cage. So, um, so I brought this little taste that I will read. This story is set about 30 years in the future um, on the north shore of Lake Superior. It's not a, a post-apocalypse story, um, but as in the memory police, certain things have been lost by the time this, this story transpires, certain assumptions that we make about our lives, people can no longer make. Um, and yet other things remain powerful and unchanged. So in this section, the narrator, whose name is Rainey, tells the story of how he fell in love with a woman named Lark, and how before they even met, she began to transform his world. When I met Lark, there were two things I had to do, two ideas to embrace or lose my chance. Reading was the first. I could read, but I rarely did. My parents, ahead of their time, had little use for books. So I grew up a knockabout, not a bully. Well, maybe sometimes. I'm not without regrets. Call me a genial fighter, a boy of six words, a lummox grinning over pancakes. Adults mention my appetite and big hands, my, ap my aptitude for labor. In a grade school Robin Hood play, I was Little John. What a good role. I played it till I was 28. By then I was working as a house painter and sitting in with two or three tavern bands in Duluth. At noon one winter day, I left my job detailing a stucco high ender with hardwood moldings and a crenellated roof like a battlement. Embarrassed to eat near meticulous homeowners, I strolled a few blocks to the library for a covert lunch behind a study carol. The carol was around the corner from the help desk where a woman with a quiet, radiant voice explained technology to ancients. There didn't seem to be any non-ancients in the library that day, only herself, 
at the desk, and me who just wanted a warm place to eat a cheese sandwich. Crane as I might, I couldn't catch sight of her, which only made her voice more arresting. The library had recently scaled back its services, and elderly women and a few men lined up for assistance. What happened to their online therapeutics? Why had their credits been refused? What was the meaning of this? Their inquiries were anxious, angry, imperious, and frightened. Her voice in reply was a hand on their shoulders, low, melodious. It settled them, reminded them they were in the right place. I hadn't felt anxious at all sitting in my carol. Yet I too felt soothed by her delivery and shut my eyes to listen. Almost right away it was impossible not to imagine hearing that voice, morning and night, a voice that was the opposite of panic. On my way out I tried to glimpse its owner. But she was obscured behind a massive, gesturing member of the clergy filing a subversive materials complaint. Same carol next day, another cheese sandwich. I went back hoping to hear again the easy low music of that voice. And sure enough, there it was, addressing the agitation and pain of the fearful. This time I sensed a tracery of humor or affection down inside it. And again I was stirred by a nameless melancholy, by envy for those who lived within that frequency, though I didn't think of it in those words. Picture a voice like a river's edge where the water turns back on itself, orbits quietly, proceeds downstream in laughter. This time when I left she had gone on break. Again I was denied the sight of she who had beguiled me. In subsequent visits, I paid attention not just to tone, but content. Pulling books as camouflage, I took a carol near her desk, though still out of view. She did far more than direct people to charts and information. Their needs exceeded the technical. She spent time with all who approached, fielding their concerns while seeming to acquire a sense of their apprehensive selves. She had a way of answering unasked questions, finessing and adjusting her recommendations. History for the ambitious, novels for the lonely, poetry for the heartbroken, all of it a lettered world alien to me. I began to take notes. Charles Dickens, she replied in a near whisper to one request, and Dickens, I wrote in stub pencil. Why, you ask? How would I know? When a flame is lit, move toward it. Titles, authors, barely floated notions. Whatever she said is what I scribbled. I didn't yet know the word oracle, but she had that smoky appeal. There seemed no person she couldn't understand, no question too dead to resurrect. She told a bored girl about a 16th century poet whose goal was to read everything ever written. Think about that. The girl did not believe her, but I did. Apparently this poet went blind in the attempt. Luminous is another word I didn't know. I finished the affluent stucco, but kept eating in the library, still choosing carols out of view, maybe fending off whatever power the sight of her might carry. By now I had got a small notebook and ballpoint and extend, expanded my use of the library to actual books. Dickens turned out a hard go. Oliver Twist, no. The beatings go on and on. But I stuck with it. Next writer on my scrappy list was this woman O'Connor whose people were confused and malformed and placed in the world as if by the god of cruelty. I couldn't bear those stories yet. Linked together, they became a rope ladder you climbed with knees and elbows out of whatever sucked you down. After this, I seemed to enter a zone of madness. It's a blur now and was then. I couldn't afford not to work, so to sustain the madness, I worked badly, falling into books, while whomever left me alone in their house to paint, latex drying on my brushes and rollers. Not everything caught, but some did. I loved the crazy fight where Beowulf goes hammer and tongs with Grendel in the longhouse, gripping the monster's arm like the world's first clamp and finally tearing it off, including the hairy shoulder, and hanging it in the rafters to drip. Come on! I was taken in, too, by the long boat ride of Odysseus with its thousand interruptions. Circe with her ominous pig yard, what had to be an invigorating layover with Calypso, and the startling wit of the Cyclops, announcing a nice surprise for Odysseus, but then guess what it was? You shall be eaten last. Holy smokes! 
Painting jobs thinned into the distance as these stories swallowed whole afternoons. A dazed reader wrapped in stormy light cast by Lake Superior, which reared up that autumn when the sun vanished seven weeks straight in a rack of permanent clouds. I banged and barged through dozens and hundreds of books discovered in my eavesdropping sessions. Not just adventures, but poetry, sweet Jesus, by Greeks and Brits and Japanese whose silky names I never can remember. Did I understand it? Not by half. But when it thunders, you know your chest is shaking. I read books of scorned science, including the raging climatologist Holloway, who predicted Lake Superior would shortly warm enough to yield bodies which had lain on the seafloor for centuries. The navigators, cooks, and ancient braves, the unlucky swimmers of antiquity, as he put it. And sure enough, Holloway hadn't been gone a decade before these dead began coming ashore, washing up in the shallows, waxy and gaping in their period clothes, frightening children on the beaches, and once tripping up a fleet of racing sailors as they foiled to an upwind mark. What else? The Norse histories lumped my throat those sleepless nights. After Odin traded an eye for knowledge, I had eight days of sympathetic response where my own left eye went dark. Recalling the poet gone blind in his zeal, I considered taking a breather, but by then was deep in the tale of a minotaur who falls for an American waitress. I couldn't bear the suspense. Would they find happiness together? I bent down to the pages with my solo eyeball blinking constantly to keep from drying out. Reaching the end, I discovered I still had both eyes after all. They both worked fine and, in fact, were full of tears. It was in this time of compulsive immersion I read the work of Molly Thorne, whose name popped up more than any other in my scattershot notes. It wasn't even her real name, Lark later confided, but the alias by which she safeguarded her prized and peculiar family. In any case, her work was hard to track down. The library had some of her poetry, an essay collection, and the single versified novel Lark described as tangy. But all were loaned out. Asking around, I learned that a local drummer named Sunderson had the novel. Fairly sure he never read it. Accepting a few dollars, he passed it to me in a crinkled brown bag, looking at my eyes with suspicion. By this time, of course, reading itself was slipping into shadow. There was a sinuous mistrust of written language. The country had recently elected its first proudly illiterate president, a man unspoilt, as he constantly bellowed, and this chimp was wildly popular everywhere he went. Once during my days in the carol, a belligerent crew cut approached Lark's desk, barking that reading was a dark art, and she lowered her voice, saying it was the darkest of all, and wouldn't he like to try it? I don't remember his reply, only his shaggy hoarse tone shaking with ignorance and desire. I wondered, did I sound that way, and if so, how to stop? Since those days, Lark had managed to locate everything of Molly Thorne's except this rumored volume, I Cheerfully Refuse, which was on the docket when its publisher sank, like the last of a shocked armada. Fittingly enough, the book was said to be a parable in response to the short period in which so many things counted on went away. A handful of advanced readers described it as a covenant with the forthcoming, a vow to creatures not yet conceived. I was glad for Lark to have found it at last, but apprehensive too. The perfect book remains unread. What's really been fun for me about working on this project is how its people are experiencing, um, as we have lately, this shrinking world, and how they respond to that. Um, some of them with fear, and some with hope, and some with despair, some with action. Uh, and all I can do is love them and send them on their way. Thanks so much for listening to me, and, and if anybody has questions or things about reading or writing that you want to discuss, I, I'm, I'm right here. All right, so if we have some questions and if we need the mic, I'll, I'll get it to you. Or we can just stand here too. Yeah, that works.
Thank you so much for that. I am curious to hear about an experience or a person or whatever it is that comes to mind that was instrumental in you becoming the person you are today. Oh, yeah. Um, great question. Maybe more than anybody, my brother Lynn, um, five years older than me, uh, went off to college um, when I was 13 and, and came back with a short story he had written um, for an English class. Gave me the story and, um, and I had that weird experience where you fall into a story and you forget your reading. Um, and it was a kind of magic, it was alchemy. It was, it was also, also, excuse me, it was also a, um, it was a love story. And I was first of all amazed that my brother who was like um, kind of macho and who I aspired to be in every way possible um, would go off to school and, and read literature and write a love story. Uh, and not, not only that, but one that I at 13 or 14 fell into um, as though it had been written by, by Dickens himself. Um, and it seemed to me that he could cast a spell. And I thought, I want to try that. Um, so I, from, that, from that day, I, I thought of myself as somebody for whom that was an option. And once you know something's an option, um, then it's up to you whether you'll pursue it or not. But, but that had a bigger effect than anything else, I think. Yeah, thanks for asking that. Leif, this is not nearly as sophisticated as a question, a question as that was, but I've just been so curious in reading your work over the years, noting that you always have very interesting and memorable names for your characters. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, is you, do you have a particular process that you go through for choosing the names for your characters? Um, I, I wish that I had a sophisticated answer. I, I don't. They just suggest themselves. And... One thing that's interesting about the naming, though, is uh, if, if I don't give the character the proper name, I can't write the character. Isn't that strange? Um, it, uh, I, th I think that's fairly common, actually. I've talked with other writers who've had that problem. And, um, and I have to be able to see them and know their name. And, and then, then I can write them in a way that I feel is fair. When I was working on, on Peace, there's a there's a character in that book named Walter, and um, Jape Walter, and he's the villain of the piece. He's a he's a bad person. He's all kinds of bad. And I was picturing him in a certain way when I was working on the book. Um, I didn't have his name, and I didn't have how he looked. Uh, I was picturing him wrong. I was picturing like a a, a, a tall, muscular. Uh, well, look, Jesse Ventura was our governor at the time. I was, I was probably picturing a wrestler. I, I don't know. Somebody really imposing and aggressive looking. And, and, um, and I forget what I named him. But I know that Robin and I were watching a movie one night called Mrs. Brown, and Billy Collins is in this movie. Sort of late middle age, Billy Collins. He's fantastic. The, the confidant of the queen, and he's... He's kind of this wild man. And after the movie, Robin said, that's what I picture with your bad guy, is a guy who looks kind of like that. Mm. And I said, no, 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 I'm Jesse Ventura. I was, I was like <laughs> invested. And, and, um, and then about a week later, um, I had been reading about a, a, a terrible guy that existed in the Superstition Mountains named uh, Jacob Walter. And he would, uh, he would lure people into the mountains and murder them. Uh, terrible. They, they don't know how many people he killed. Uh, but he was so uh, terrifying, and I thought, well, there's, there's a name. There's a name. And then I was thinking about, what, but what should he look like? I've got his look wrong. Um, Walter does not seem like, like my, the character I was thinking about. And I went to Robin and said, I've had an idea. I think he should look like I think you should look like Billy Collins in that movie. Um, because this happens constantly. Robin says something to me and, and I take it on board and then I forget she said it and I rewrite it into my own idea. And then I present it as mine. And Robin says, 
that was my idea. And I'm like, no. <laughs> it totally was. Um, little rabbit trail there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Name, names are important. This may sound silly, but can you tell us what it's cost you to be a writer? Um, what does it cost? That's a really good question. I think it costs um, some things that are, are more psychological uh, or um, maybe, maybe spiritual, to use an inexpensive word. Um, and then some things that are, that are kind of physical. It's strange to make a living in a way where every few years you sort of get a big check and then that lasts you until you get another big check. And the checks are large for, for someone raised in the Midwest as a teacher's son. Um, but, <laughs> but it is also true that on about year three, Robin says, when can we expect something from you? <laughs> Fair enough. Um, that, that is a little bit of a cost because it's just, it's unreliable. Um, it puts a lot of, of stock in my ability to, um, to be inspired enough to write a book that anyone wants to read, which is not a guarantee, I have realized. I used to think, oh, that'll be, that, now, now it's something I can do. My first book came out and it made all these friends. And I thought, well, I guess I can do this now. And then it just, it was really difficult. I seem to have to reinvent the wheel every time. I don't know why that is. Um, so I think that's been, that's been hard, particularly for, for my wife sometimes. Um, but I think it also costs, uh, it costs something that maybe I didn't have anyway by the time I, fo I stopped being a reporter. I was a reporter for Minnesota Public Radio for 15, 16 years before I, before I quit to do this full time. Um, and I think what that job did was it taught me that I, I can't accept very much at face value. Um, Wynn talked about um, my dedication to the truth or at least my pursuit of that idea. And that is something that was pounded into me um, as, a, as a reporter um, because I was taught to look for things that are real, answers that are real, and not just someone's idea of what they want me to think reality is. I think being a novelist does the same thing because you're not out to persuade anyone of something. You're not trying to win them to your side of an argument. That's not a novel, that's propaganda. You're just going for, you're trying to tell the truest story you can by use of fictional people and situations. So perhaps being a writer has made me a little bit more of a cynic about human nature, um, which, I, which I love but do not trust. <laughs> That's, I guess, a cost. Uh, thank you. Um, you mentioned how John Gardner says that uh, you know you're trying to make a vivid, continuous dream. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, you described also how your your brother brought that story home, and then that kind of was the case for you as you read it, and you're like, "Whoa!" Yeah. I just had a vivid, continuous dream while yeah. I was reading my brother. Um, yeah. So, what is it uh, that you found in your process of writing fiction that um, the, the sort of obstacles that prevent the dream from continuing to be yeah. vivid and continuous? Yeah. And then what are the elements that you've found that keep it alive, vivid, and moving? Well, that's not complex at all. Um, distraction is a problem for me. I'm easily distracted, both by things that are um, out there, uh, you know, Geez, the internet is terrible. <laughs> it's also fantastic. Um, but when I started doing this, there was no internet. And um, 
And now there is, and it's, it's an issue because even if you're uh, blocked in your office with the door shut, uh, and even if you've got like waves on your sound system, <laughs> just white noise, which I sometimes employ, um, you can always just click over and check email. And it's really difficult not to do that. It's very hard. Uh, because as, as every writer I know thinks, writing is really tough, miserable work. It's all so glorious, and, and I guess the, the thing that makes it possible to ignore the distractions enough to get something done is, is that the work is such fun. Um, and what's fun about it is you have, a, you have a person in your mind, you have a character in your mind or a narrator, and something is happening in their world. And I, I don't know... Wh- Maybe it's, it's the same thing that makes me susceptible to distraction makes me susceptible to focus. And it's, it's not that tough to just sort of step into somebody else's world, step into somebody else's point of view, and to just write. Um, and then the, the real joy is in the second draft and everything thereafter because the, the work of the plot, plotting is just miserable and there's nothing for it. I mean, you have to plot. And, and, and it's just no fun, and nothing you do is going to make plotting fun. I, not for me. I, I despise it. Uh, but once that, once that is done, then it's about the words on the page. It's about the writing. It's about the poetry. It's about reading a sentence and changing it for the 20th or 30th time because you haven't quite got it to sing. Um, you know, it, I, I took eight years writing Virgil Wander. I wrote it twice. I threw the first one out after five years and started again because I just woke up to the notion that it was terrible. I didn't even keep the draft. I pressed delete. It was, it was a radical act. Um, but I, I had to. Otherwise, I was going to publish something that people would say, this isn't good. I knew it wasn't good. I started again and I wrote a book I, I was happy with. Um, it's not to say everyone's going to be happy with everything you do. It's not, never going to happen. But you've got to love it. And if you love it, you overcome distraction. That's the best I can do with that. Yeah. Yes? I'm fascinated to hear that after five years, you threw away a draft and just started over. And I... And one of the things we've talked, at least amongst ourselves as the writing cohort, about is sort of the the heavy emotional toll of writing. Mm. Um, and in that moment where you realize, like, this is not what I want it to be, and you threw it away, <laughs> how did you continue t- to go back to it? Um, I think I went back because I understood what I had done wrong. I understood what I had done wrong. Uh, the the backstory on this is that um, when I was just finishing up the first draft, I got meningitis, and I didn't. Nobody knew what I had, and I was one of those deals. I was the mystery patient. I, I ended up in several different hospitals, and and they shipped blood samples everywhere to every lab and tried to figure out what it was. No, you never want to be the mystery virus guy. Um, and and it was pretty serious. I just I couldn't stop losing weight. Um, I, I didn't have a lot to lose, and then I dropped 20 pounds in two weeks, and I, it was just uh, frightening, and my friends thought I was going to die. Um, and then afterwards, when they, fi- they finally figured it out, they put me on this wonderful, expensive medication that I took for a month, and after a week, I knew I would live because I, 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 my body felt better. Um, but I couldn't. My eyes didn't work correctly. I couldn't really watch TV. I couldn't read. I couldn't write. I couldn't think straight. Um, the fever, which sometimes was 104, had, had spiked to a, a place that um, I wasn't sure my brain would ever work correctly again. I was wondering, what, what am I going to do now? I mean, could I maybe get a, a mail route and just like a walking route? That would have been fantastic. I've always fantasized about being a mailman. Um, but after three or four months of, of recovery, I opened my laptop and I read my finished manuscript of the new book. And um, that was the saddest day of my life. 
because, um, I mean, it was just lacking everything. It just didn't, it, um, I don't want to talk about it. It was, it was depressing. So um, I, I talked to Robin about it and she said, well, what do you have to do? I said, I think I have to start over. <laughs> Here's love. Um, she said, well, do what you have to and I won't, I won't crowd you about it. Do what you have to. So I, I, I deleted it. I didn't delete it until I had, I had written a first chapter uh, with a new narrator. Virgil was in it before, but his name was something else. I had named him wrong. See how important that is? Um, and he, he had the theater, but he wasn't telling the story. And he hadn't gone through what he had gone through, his near-death experience where he goes in the lake and gets pulled out by his friend. Um, essentially, he has met death and he has lived, and now he has another chance. And when I lived through the meningitis, it wasn't as dramatic as going over a cliff, but to me it felt like that. Uh, everything was different. Everything had changed. And the world that I woke up into seemed very different to me than it had when I had gotten sick. Um, it, it really was a different story. So I... I wrote an adjacent story and set in the same town, set in Greenstone. Many of the same characters were there, but there was, uh, there was a, um, a before and after element to Virgil's character that I was able to utilize that was not in the first book, and the book needed that. And so once I realized that's what it needs, then I was confident that I could write it again. So then I hit delete. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, was, it wasn't a great day. Since you're talking about Virgil Wander, um, this is my own question. Adam Lear, <laughs> is he the sturgeon? <laughs> is like in a magical realism world, does yeah. he turn into the sturgeon? Well, he does in my world. Um, I, I, I've run into people who were so uncomfortable with that that, that they had to read it the other way. But, and that is why I left it ambiguous because I, I did not want it to be a huge problem for a, a great number of readers. But, um, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's 100% the sturgeon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we have time for two more. This one. Did you, <clears throat> did you know So Brave, Young, and Handsome was the title when you began? Or did that come later in the No, I knew it part? was. I knew it was because of that song, you know. We all loved our comrade, so brave, young, and handsome. We all loved our comrade, although he'd done wrong. I mean, look, that's a great song, The Cowboy's Lament. And I thought th the title was actually a miscalculation on my part because I believed that everybody knew that song. But they didn't. They didn't know the song. I knew the song because... My mom would put it on the stereo at night when I was going to sleep. And I thought that was the most beautiful story in the world, you know. You're, you're, a, you're a tragic young cowboy and you're all wrapped up in your, in your grave cloth and you're laying on the street and, um, and you've had this wild life and you got shot down in your prime. Boy, when I was six, that was, I wanted to be that guy. That was the most romantic thing I'd ever heard. Um, and so I tried to tap into a little of that for that, that book. Um, congratulations on having read it. <laughs> I'm curious about, you know, we're talking about revision and enjoying the process of revision. Yeah. Um, two-part question. One, I'd love to know if you have a favorite sentence you've written that you're really proud of because um, you talked about going back and finding the poetry and then how do you know when you're done with the revision? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't, I don't think I really have a favorite okay. sentence. <laughs> um, that would be more than I could do. Um, I know I'm done when, uh, I guess I just hit a place where I'm so tired of it. <laughs> You know, and you just think, is this noun that bad that I need to replace it? Um, have I gotten rid of all the adverbs? 
Um, look, revision is, I do enjoy it, but it's like, it's like somebody said about bankruptcy. It happens really slow and then it happens real fast. Uh, and that's how revision is. I, I might you know, go over a chapter 15 times or 20 times or 25 times and, and enjoy it every time because, you know, there's nothing as nice as... I love painting a, a room in my, in my house because it's work you can see. And, and, you know, the day starts and you got a tan room and at the end you got one that's deep blue and you're like, yes! Um, that's how it is when you revise a chapter, even for the 15th time, because you know that it's closer to singing than it was when you started. It feels great. I really like that kind of work. But you do hit a point, and especially when your ed editor says, now it's got to be done. <laughs> um, and my editor is Elizabeth Schmitz at Grove Atlantic. She's really good at that. She knows when something is done. She's terrific at it. Um, thank God for editors. Yeah. <clears throat> You know, whenever the band has played really good, there's always an encore. Um, so, do we have one encore question? Anything? Thank you. Um, so, it was interesting to me that your book, you said it was set 30 years, your new yeah, project. Yeah. So, in 30 years, I'll be a really elderly English teacher. <laughs> um, so, it's interesting to think about being a grumpy, elderly English teacher in a world that doesn't value literature uh -huh. in the same way that um, we do now or maybe in the past. I don't know, I wasn't around. But um, so do you have any words of advice to how do I continue to emphasize the value of literature in the way that you've put it tonight as like being a way that we discover truth and humanity and like as a rope ladder, I like that a lot. So I don't know, any words for that? Oh yeah, I, for, <laughs> look, yeah. That's the world's best question, I'm so glad you asked it. Um, um, look, the, I'm so thrilled to hear that you're gonna be a grumpy English teacher in 30 years. I, I hope that there are thousands like you all across the country, and I'm sure there are, I'm sure there are. That's what gives me optimism is people like you um, uh, and people like my, my kids who, who have the same feeling. They're not English teachers, but they love English teachers. Um, no, you're, you're doing exactly the right thing right now, planning to go off and be an, an English teacher. Let me tell you what my English teacher did when I was in high school. She, um, uh, she was a teacher I had for both grammar and for the more creative writing arts. I wrote my first short stories for her. She pulled me aside when I was 16 years old and said, there's a contest for, for, for writers 16 through 18 who write novels. And I said, novels? I was 16. She gave me The Outsiders by Susan Hinton. She said, read this. Susan was 16 when she wrote this book. I took it home and read it that night. I was like, oh, this can be done. I was instantly filled with way too much confidence. I started a novel right away. <laughs> I started a novel the next day, literally, and I wrote eight pages, and it was just tear. I just wasn't ready. I wasn't Sue Hinton. I couldn't do it. But I never forgot it. I never forgot it because that teacher thought I could. She thought I could do it. She thought I would understand what a novel was and what a novel could do, and I knew what they could do as, read as a reader, I wasn't a mature enough writer, obviously, at that point, and, and few, few are. But if you can just hand the right book, or even the wrong book, to as many kids as possible, don't even worry about if it's the right book. You'll know the right book. Um, but I would say stray from the curriculum. And, um, and when a student stops to talk to you about something, say, uh, well, about your concern, um, I have these thoughts. But now, aside from your concern, have you heard about this book? <laughs> and then hand it to them, because honest to God, nothing else is going to work as well as that is. And that, that could change, that's got the potential to change the entire picture. I, I draw kind of a bleak picture of the world in this story. Um, although I'm careful to leave room for hope, because otherwise I wouldn't be honest. 
I, I have too much hope not to allow hope into my, into my work. Besides, who wants to read something that's all entirely bleak? Of course, I read The Road and I, I, didn't, I didn't feel like that was as bleak as everybody else thought it was. I, I loved that story. Um, and I, I thought there was room for hope in that too. So there's going to be room for hope in mine and there will be room in, for hope in your, in your grumpy future. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thanks so much. This is really fun.